Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream today. My name is Laura Michael Balderson. Uh, I work for Monticello in the uh, education department. Um, and we are here today uh, with Caroline Klibanoff of Made By Us and uh, Chabu Kapumba from Civics Unplugged to talk about uh, the civic season. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, our two other guests here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you all a little bit about what they do. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you so much for having us here. I know Chabu and I are both excited to tell you a little more about the civic season. Just by way of introduction, my name is Caroline Klivanoff, as Laura Michael said, and I'm the managing director of Made by Us, which is a relatively new initiative that's bringing together hundreds of the nation's historic sites, museums, historical societies together in collaboration to reach and engage the next generation with history as a tool for civic participation. So we know that history is important to power the future. Um, it's that critical context that we need. And so Made by Us is bringing history to where young people are, meeting them where they are online, sharing that history in new and exciting ways. And the civic season is one such way. And we're delighted especially to be um, to have Monticello as one of our founding partners of Made by Us that, that was part of the group of history leaders that got together years ago and said, look, we've got to do more to engage the next generation and we've got to team up to do it. It's so important. Um, and Monticello has been a great leader for the Made by Us program. So thank you for having us here. And I'm happy to follow up. Hi, my name is Chabu Kapumba. Um, I am a empowerment associate at Civics Unplugged. Civics Unplugged is an organization that's dedicated to empowering Gen Z to be the leaders of today and tomorrow. Um, so we do a lot of training and systems thinking centered around democracy reform and how we can actively um, train young people to take on that role because we most definitely have the capacity um, at, Civics, at Civics Unplugged, we believe that the kids will lead. And so, um, in this partnership with Made by Us, we've had so many opportunities to kind of explore how we can craft the future that we want. And a big part of that has been engaging in civic season um, and laying the foundation for something really, really incredible. So I'm super excited to have this conversation here today. Well, we're very excited to have you both with us. Um, and I'm gonna ask this first question of Caroline. Um, so you talked a little bit about Made by Us, um, but can you tell us um, sort of more about what that organization does as a whole um, and how that's led you to the civic season? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a few key, kind of key pillars through Made by Us that we focus on in order to do things differently than they've been done before. Um, and for all the fans out there of historic sites and museums, you're not alone. I'm also a super fan. And museums do great work to engage young audiences, K-12 audiences, educators. Um, but there is a bit of a gap, you know, when you're in your 20s or you're out of the um, college age. How can you connect with institutions? There's not that many bridges to reach people, you know, millennials and Gen Z. Um, with history and with historic sites. But it's such a critical window because that's the time when many young people are first deploying their civic identity and kind of finding their way in the landscape of American democracy. And a site like Monticello, of course, is so has so many important stories to share for people doing that kind of work. And I know that Chabu and her colleagues at Civics Unplugged are really those architects of the future. So as the next generation is shaping our future, we wanna make sure they have access to the resources and expertise that museums and historic sites can offer. And I think, you know, going back to the early days of when we were planning Made by Us with Monticello and the New York Historical Society and the Smithsonian Museum of American History, and actually now um, 10 total museums that are part of our steering committee, um, Part of the reason why we came together in this collaboration is that we recognized that the founders of this country, many of them were young people themselves. Um, I think sometimes we say Thomas Jefferson, who was only 33 when he signed the Declaration of Independence, was almost like a millennial today. Um, and I think one of the other important aspects of that is that even Thomas Jefferson, 
you know, the president didn't wake up one day as president or even vice president. His path started much earlier. It started, you know, when he um, was in the House of Burgesses or the House, you know, it started in a continuum of civic participation. And it can start with a small step, just seeing yourself as part of the story. So we're really delighted to work with groups like Civics Unplugged, work with organizations all across the country to facilitate this groundswell of interest in youth civic participation. Wonderful. And yeah, we often think about Thomas Jefferson as like when he's like in his 60s and he's president, but you're right, he's only 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Um, and part of the reason that he receives that task is because he's young and new to the Continental Congress. Uh, and there's an argument to be made that it's because he is sort of a fresh participant, right? A lot of the other people who are already at the Continental Congress um, are really busy because they've been there a long time and he shows up. He is known as a good writer. He's from Virginia, which is important strategically, um, but he's also just young and new and kind of has the time and energy uh, to do something um, important, right? Um, like write the declaration. So I'm going to ask uh, Chabu now to tell us more about Civics Unplugged, what's your mission, uh, and then how does that practically get carried out? And so at Civics Unplugged, our, one of our key missions is let the kids lead um, and really providing meaningful pathways to engage in democracy reform in ways that actually create impact. Um, so it really comes from a place of reimagining civic education and what that could look like. And the way that we approach it is really we have this four month long fellowship. Um, where students engage in all kinds of content related to systems thinking and self-development. And what it really does is start a civic journey. And so it's really just the beginning of a lifelong commitment um, to participating and contributing to our communities, no matter how small or big. Um, and we love what we do as an organization. I was a founding fellow at Civics Unplugged, um, and now I have the opportunity to kind of contribute to Civics Unplugged and my wider communities. And so it really has created, again, meaningful pathways um, to engage in your civic journey. And so that's how we naturally arrived to this idea of civic season, because um, such a big component of what makes Civics Unplugged special is that sense of community, um, that, you know, group of people who are actively thinking alongside you on how we can do better, how we can evolve, um, what our role can shape, can shape out to be. And so we wanted to expand that sense of community to the general public. And so kind of focusing ideas like 4th of July and Juneteenth and Flag Day um, and having a national community and national brain trust on, you know, how can we evolve for the better? How can we appreciate and learn collectively? Um, that's how Civics Unplugged kind of leaned into letting the kids lead by kind of mapping out civic season, but then also just training for this lifelong civic journey and of course, grounding it in community. Wonderful. Um well, so you've talked a little bit about the civic season, but that is really what we want to dig into here. So can you talk about practically what is the civic season? And then how did you um, come to uh, an understanding uh, that this was needed um, and why now? Well, we actually have a video where people can tell you in their own words what the civic season is and how it's going to to roll out this summer. And then Chabu and I could talk through, you know, how to get involved and how we came up with it. Does that work? Wonderful, yeah. Cool. Democracy isn't dead. But it won't survive without us. All of us. We hear the call loud and clear for a more inclusive American story. This year, join in for a civic season that honors all of our stories so that we can build into our future from a more complete understanding of our past. Made by Us is a coalition of hundreds of museums and historic sites across the country. And we teamed up with the next generation of those shaping the future of our democracy at Civics Unplugged to create the Civic Season. I think that we don't talk enough about 
what the world could look like in terms of an optimistic, positive sense. It's no secret the practice of our democracy has never met the promise of our founding ideal. But it is in our hands to change that. Being patriotic just means that you believe America can be better, you have a vision for that, and that you work towards it. Civic participation is good for democracy, especially, especially youth civic participation. There are so many ways to strengthen your democracy that other people might be doing that you may not be aware of, but that you might love to try. And so Civic Season is a great way to be exposed to all these different ways to level up your leadership and to level up your communities and your democracy. So from your local historical society to the Smithsonian and the National Archives, hundreds of museums and historic sites and civic organizations are participating in the Civic Season to provide resources from many perspectives. We still have much work to put in to achieve true equity and equality. It's a uh, pretty intense time to be alive, but also so much hope. The 4th of July is great for fireworks, but there's a lot more that we could use the 4th of July for when it comes to civic engagement. Between June 14th, which is Flag Day, Juneteenth, a critically important day in our history, all the way through July 4th, Independence Day, we will use this moment to invigorate a season of imagining what it means to tell a more inclusive story. You learn from the past to make a better future, right? So I think that acknowledgement, that education, that awareness, those opening up your mind in those ways is so important for fixing it, to make sure that those issues are not faced by future generations. Democracy should be more so seen as a verb uh, rather than just a noun, that we, all, we have a democracy and, and we're good. And so I hope that the civic season every summer will inspire more people to make real change and keep making progress. And I really believe that it'd be incredible to have time set aside to think as a collective, as a United Nation, um, about how we can better our methods, approach, and thinking in regards to developing as a country. Progress is never perfect, but we power change. It's up to us. This is our time, this is our season. Our civic season. Visit theCivicSeason.com to get started. There are a million ways to get involved now. Something for everyone. Let's get going. So I'll just say for our special viewers at Monticello, this is a sneak peek. Um, the Civic Season is coming. It is going to launch Flag Day, June 14th. Um, and our website will be live later this week, probably Friday. So if you're going there, there's nothing there yet, but we can't wait to show you. And I just, you know, we wanted to get the word out, especially to those viewing this live stream to make sure you're a part of it. Yeah. Um, so the civic season um, has many different pieces, right? There's lots of different ways to get involved. So Caroline, can you tell us um, about some of the programs that will be taking place and how people can get involved in different ways? Yeah, sure. So the civic season um, is, a, is sort of a new concept, but it makes a lot of sense because it builds on what we already do, a celebration of Juneteenth or a celebration of July 4th. We're already in this season during the summer where we're thinking about the past, we're commemorating the past, we're remembering how we got here and thinking about what comes next. So it's really the natural outflow of that. Um, and so during the civic season, you can go to theCivicSeason.com when it is live on Friday. Um, and you can find all kinds of ways to level up your history knowledge, kind of um, skill up your civic engagement practices, um, whether that's listening to a podcast on voting rights, participating in a conversation with others that you might you know, disagree with, um, exploring an online exhibit about a part of our history you didn't know. There's so many formats and so many, there's live events, there's things, activities you can do on your own, there's quizzes, there's games, there's a comedy show. Um, there's really, there are 450 events, programs, and resources to choose from. So whatever your preference, right? If you are like, I want to listen to something on my lunch break, or I want something to do on my commute, or you know, I want to share something with um, my students or my family members, there's something for everyone. And you know, that's true if you have five minutes or two hours that you want to devote to it. So I just encourage you to explore, explore, explore. Um, and we wanna hear what resonates with you. So as you take part in the civic season, 
starting June 14th through July 4th, let us know online, you know, hashtag civic season, let us know what you're doing, what appealed to you, what you've learned. We have some bingo cards you can fill out. So there's a lot of ways to participate and add your voice. Um, but I think it might be, it's also important, you know, to hear how we got these, this set of events and how we got the themes for this year. Um, and that was a really significant process of research and discovery um, that we did with Civics Unplugged as well. Yeah, um, Chabu, can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Yeah, so once our community kind of recognized the fact that we wanted to, again, expand this larger sense of having a collective experience dedicated to bettering and adding more meaning to um, incredible events like 4th of July, Juneteenth, and Flag Day, um, we really didn't want to make any assumptions. So we hosted these Socratic dialogues um, in collaboration with the Made By Us team and spoke to Gen Zers from across the country um, and talking about their experiences with 4th of July, their experiences and feelings about America as a whole, both history and now, um, worries that they had for the future, and really just making space to explore what are our priorities um, in civic season, what are our ambitions, and mapping out both what we'd like to, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, what we'd like to address, but more importantly, what we hope to achieve in the coming years. So it was a really amazing community exploratory experience. And we were able to hear from students and historians and civic practitioners in the same room to kind of dig into what questions do you have? What do you like about July 4th? I mean, one thing that we heard, um, and Chabu may remember this from our sessions, one thing that we heard over and over again was to me, July 4th is a day of rest and relaxation and I spend it with family. You know, I'm not thinking about 1776 and I'm not thinking about 2021. I just want to have a hot dog. And that's totally reasonable. And so part of the reason why we listen to what people are saying and what they want and need, now the civic season site includes a lot of activities for rest and reflection. Maybe you want to walk to a veterans memorial and consider, you know, your place in the larger story here or or what it means to sacrifice. Um, or maybe you just want to have a conversation with your family about, um, doesn't even have to be the news of the day. It may just be that connection with others that interdependence that's part of our, you know, the big picture of, of democracy. So there's something for everyone. Yeah, um, that's awesome that there's such a range of um, options and sort of styles of engagement uh, to fit with the diversity of the American people, right? Um, so sort of Caroline and then Chabu, can you talk about why it's important to continue to tell larger and fuller stories about our history in the United States? Yeah, I mean, it's really a timely question as we're here today on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre, you know, which destroyed uh, a community in Oklahoma, Black Wall Street. Yesterday was Memorial Day also a day of remembrance and considering how we got here. And both Memorial Day and this, this anniversary, which you know commemorates not a unique event, but a devastating one nonetheless, both of these dates, as well as Juneteenth, as well as July 4th, have a lot to do with rebuilding because how we remember the past has, has a lot to do with healing and repair from the harm that's been done and it sets the foundation for us to carry forth into the future. So, you know, I think sometimes people think history is just a set of facts that happened in the past, but there's so much that we do today about how we remember it, how we celebrate it, how we commemorate it, whose stories get told, that really does affect how we chart our course into the future. So I think, you know, the reason this is important to tell a fuller story now is because the next chapter is up to us. So if, it's only if we are informed by a full, well-rounded history, if we understand there's so many American stories that shaped this nation, um, it moves us away from a binary choice. And especially in a digital age, why choose? We have so much space for all of our stories. There's room for everyone. And we're still a part of it today. So the civic season is really about facilitating ways to 
tell that fuller story, explore that fuller story, and recognize that our traditions are always evolving to meet our current needs. So this first year especially, this is, we would love for you to get involved and you know give your input on the civic season. This is not um, a done deal. It's not like, you know, this is the civic season from now on, it will always be this way. It is a living thing, especially in this first year. So we hope you'll be a part of it. Share your thoughts, give us your input, tell us what you wanna hear um, because it's only through we the people working together that we really can evolve our traditions to match our complex story. Absolutely. And kind of just to follow up on just the absolute relevance of history and creating a much bigger picture, um, especially from the perspective of the, our current generation, a lot of our experiences learning history focused on like a very specific type of person. And so we rarely see ourselves as, you know, parts of people who have mobilized or people who have impact or communities that have contributed um, to make America what it is. And so I think a big part of this is also just create, in order to form an identity, there has to be some founding inspiration. And there's just so much amazing context to pull on. There are so many amazing communities um, that are often marginalized in our narrative as a nation. And there's resilience there and there's strength there that all Americans can really resonate with. And so that's what's really exciting about having this bigger picture being mapped out or having amazing institutions like this one um, kind of help guide that process because the discovery um, can also be the inspiration process that leads to coming to understand where you might like to have your U-shaped hole. It's so well said, Chavu, and I'm just reminded that, you know, it's not, it, the civic season expands the lens and it's not only about, um, as you said so well, it is about, you know, telling stories that have not been told before, have not been highlighted, but it's also about getting some more nuance into the story. Um, I think even when we think about July 4th, what does it commemorate? The signing of the Declaration of Independence. Huge, landmark, super important, there's no debating it. But it wasn't the end, it wasn't a victory, and it wasn't you know the beginning of the story either. Certainly people had lived here for hundreds of years. Um, but I think the Declaration of Independence to me is almost reassuring as part of that murky middle. They didn't know how it was gonna turn out. They took a stand for a really bold and big idea. And this is how many of us might feel now. We don't know the end of the story, but it's up to us to take steps along the way to ensure that we are strengthening our communities and our democracy and our nation. Yeah, and I think what makes me really excited about again, doing this like in coalition with Made By Us is the fact that when I think of signing of the declaration, no one has ever framed it around the idea of like, this is the murky middle. There was uncertainty. Um, and so just like learning or even relearning some of the things that we feel that we already understand or have knowledge on um, and reframing it and seeing just how much is there, how much is layered in that story. Um, there's just so much amazing things that can come from that. So again, obviously we're very biased here, um, but there's just so much that we can learn even from the things that we feel that we understand already through civic season. So. Yeah, um, just listening to you guys talk, I'm reminded of um, in the Constitution, which Jefferson did not write, right? That was his friend, James Madison. Um, but in the Constitution, right, it says, we the people in order to form a more perfect union, not a perfect union, right? A more perfect union. And to me, that just is like a little reminder to look back and remember that for eight years, the United States functioned under the Articles of Confederation, right? We weren't sort of birthed as a fully formed functioning nation. There was this whole process in the early Republic where things had to be figured out and hashed out and debated and they tried something and it worked in some ways, but they thought they could do better. And so our constitution, right? Um, and that even the like foundational language of our governmental documents is like, we are trying this and we assume that it's gonna evolve over time. Um, so along those lines, uh, I'm gonna ask Chabu, um, why is it so important to engage the next generation in these conversations? I mean, for starters, it's so obvious that we will be not only dealing with the consequences of the shortcomings of our current 
um, the way that we're ex is existing now, but then also our generation has so much excitement and natural inclination um, for building better systems for everyone. Um, and it's really, really key that we capitalize on that energy um, because that can be what the paradigm shift that sets the tone for you know a lot of future generations to operate in ways that um, help us evolve faster and better and quicker, um, like you mentioned earlier. And so I think centering work around future generations means centering work towards evolving for the better today and tomorrow. Um, so I couldn't think of a better way to kind of invest time and energy. Yeah. Um, so I have a Jefferson quote that is sort of related to this topic of, of um, the next generation. Um, so Jefferson uh, was not in the United States when the Constitution was being written. He was an ambassador in Paris during this time. Um, and honestly, he was a little bit annoyed that he wasn't here to be part of that debate process. But um, that means he wrote a lot of letters about his thoughts on the Constitution. Um, so he writes a letter in September of 1789 to James Madison. And he starts the letter by saying, like, I, I'm not giving you any news in this letter. This is just me working out some thoughts that I have. So, like, I'll send you a newsletter later. Um, but <laughs> this is just some, some musings that I have. Um, and he begins with this sort of philosophical proof, basically. He, like, lays out these ideas about debt and how you shouldn't be able to bind the following generation to debt. Um, there's conversations to be had about Jefferson's presidency and the debt that was incurred by the federal government, but that's not what he's talking about at this point. That hasn't happened. But he writes uh, after he talks about how you shouldn't be able to bind future generations to debt. He writes, no society can make a perpetual constitution or even a perpetual law. The earth always belongs to the living generation. They may manage it then and what proceeds from it as they please during their usufruct. They are masters, too, of their own persons and consequently may govern them as they please. And then a little bit later, he says, every constitution then and every law naturally expires at the end of 19 years. And he picks 19 based on um, life expectancy tables at the time. So he sort of figures out, like, based when you reach the age of majority, how long do you get to sort of rule as a generation? And he basically says... Every 19 years, the next generation should get to be in charge and should be able to experiment the way that he and his generation had done. So I'd love to hear thoughts from from sort of both of you on, you know, he writes at the end of the letter, like this might seem like just like a philosophical sort of musing. But if you think about it, this is real and practical and we should apply it. <laughs> No, um, it makes, well, I can't put it nearly as eloquently, <laughs> um, but it just screams of the validity and insight that young people have that is often brushed off. Um, I think about like the Senate and Congress and just the medium age is well beyond the age of 30. There's no 20 year olds, there are a few 30 year olds. Um, and so, it, and not having the ability to take up space where decisions are being made about the future, um, it just further emphasizes the fact that young people not only have something worthwhile to contribute, but they should be at the forefront of this, um, if anything, because there you have a genuine understanding of the implications um, of the way that things have been quote unquote ruled um, in the past. So I fully <laughs> agree, um, a 19 year expiration date, I'd be really interested, interested to see how that plays out. It's so interesting to me too, because I think it is happening that way. It does happen that way. I mean, so we're coming up on the anniversary of the 26th amendment on July 2nd, I think, which lowered the voting age to 18. And we were, I was doing some research on this with, with some colleagues and there's a movement today to lower the voting age even further to 16. And, you know, there's parallels to be drawn. Um, but the interesting thing is that before 1971, when the voting age was lowered to 18, young people were actively involved in politics. I'm not saying they shouldn't have had the right to vote, but it didn't stop them from being heard and making their voice heard. Um, and so in many ways, you know, you can't stop that train that if you go on Instagram, 
the conversation is happening now around civics and democracy and even history. Um, it's really a, a moving, it's a moving train. And, you know, I think the more we can do to harness that energy and say, this is exactly the kind of engagement and excitement and participation that we want to see, the better. Um, the other piece I'll just share is that that quote really made me think um, how we think about history is, is as being something for the living. You know, it's not just a record of the past, but it's for us to use today. And our memorials and monuments and our commemorations are really that space where the past meets the present. I mean, commemoration is for the living. It's for us to recall the past and, you know, use that past as we shape the future. And so the civic season, for example, is one way to expand the lens on what and how we commemorate so that we're able to reflect our complex past and then use that as a springboard to power the future that we want. Yeah. Um, well, Caroline, can you um, talk a little bit about what role history organizations can play in this effort? Yes, absolutely. So we, Made by Us, is a coalition across the country of over 100 historic sites and organizations and museums um, from Monticello on out. It's just really a remarkable collaboration. But for the civic season, it's whether you're part of Made by Us already or you're just hearing about it today, come one, come all to the civic season. We have almost 200 organizations that have submitted events, programs, resources, you know, everything from walking tours to live programs and panels to their podcasts and videos. So that's a huge array of, of participating organizations for a total of 450 um, events and tools that you can explore. But even if you weren't a part of that set or you're just hearing about this now and you have an organization, we encourage you to join in, you know, be a part of the conversation on social media, check out the civicseason.com when it goes live on Friday and really spread the word. Um, you know, sometimes we compare this to other traditions that have evolved like Giving Tuesday, which took a season of giving and created a day of action around it. The civic season takes this season, this existing season of commemoration and thinking about freedom and independence and says, let's get together, let's mobilize everyone to take part take one step during the civic season, do one activity, you know, visit one museum, um, do one act of participation, registering to vote or researching an issue. And together we can use that to shape a stronger democracy. Yeah, and I love that you said mobilize everyone. Um, that's been really important um, in my work here at Monticello. Uh, I do a lot of work sort of developing resources to promote civic engagement. Um, and it became really clear to me as I was doing this work that civics is so often um, framed in terms of citizenship. And there's obviously all sorts of overlap there, um, but also that the United States um, has throughout history denied citizenship to many, many people who are actually incredibly civically active. So, for example, uh, like Frederick Douglass is 50 years old when the 14th Amendment is passed. That means that as someone born in the United States, he's eligible for citizenship, right? But he's civically active for decades prior to that, right? Um, and that's just one of many, many stories. Uh, and here at Monticello, uh, we often find that it is um, descendants of the enslaved community here at Monticello who are really pushing forward these ideas about being civically engaged that Jefferson writes about. Um, and so it just became really important for us to talk about um, civics sort of as something that can be done whether or not you are a citizen of the United States. You can be involved in your community. You can um, push these ideas forward. Um, and that in many, many cases, it is civic action that leads to inclusion in citizenship, right? So there is overlap there, but we want to make sure that we are inviting everyone to be a part of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, there's a spectrum of civic participation and Chabu can speak to this, you know, with all the work that you all do to create a community around that. So even creating a community is an act of civic engagement because without that community of support, you're on your own. 
And we live in a country where we are interdependent, you know, especially the last year of COVID-19 has shown us that. So there's, there's so many ways for any individual person. It doesn't just require voting. It doesn't just mean you, you take up a, you know, go to a protest. There's, there's many different activities. I don't know, Chabu, if you have some examples from Civics Unplugged to share. Um, um, I think that what really comes to mind is the fact that like unconventional pathways have actually proven to be the most um, meaningful and impactful um, experiences when it comes to being civically engaged. And so, for example, it's here at Civics Unplugged, we really, really value dialogue. And so like at face value, what's a conversation going to do? But those conversations have broadened our sense of thinking, have expanded how we look into things, have provided insight. Um, and that is the very definition of widening the scope and expanding the narrative. And so something as simple as like a conversation, and there are tons of like dialogue tools that are also available at Civic Season, um, has proven to be massively helpful. And so again, nothing is too small, um, even if it's just an individual reflection. Reflection is another thing that's been really, really useful. That's time taken just to kind of think back on how are things? Why do I engage in things this way? Or how do I feel or am reacting um, to the millions of things that seem to be happening every day um, in our current times? Incredibly useful. And it's almost, it's it's difficult to even pinpoint um, the true impact that that can have on someone over time. So again, unconventional pathways have proven to be the best pathway um, when it comes to civic engagement. I could listen to Chavo speak all day. It's so <laughs> well said. You, they just took the words out of my mouth. It's so good. I mean, every action adds up. When I think of the Civic Season website, which you know is going to have all these things you can explore, and you can say, "This is for me today. I'll do this tomorrow." I almost envision like a grain of sand, like dropping to the little corner of the screen. If someone wants to build this for us, that would be great. But you know, a little <laughs> grain of sand. Every time someone takes this, an action, they they listen to a history podcast, they visited a museum, they registered to vote, they um, took see if they could pass the citizenship quiz, and all of that becomes a, the foundation of what our nation is built on. It's everyone's actions, the collective sum of what we do together that really matters. Yeah. Um, well, thank you both so much. We have time for one more question. Um, so I'm gonna ask you both, what are your hopes for the future and the impact of the civic season? It's the first year, um, but long-term dreaming big, what are you guys hoping for? Um, I'm happy to get us started. I think that, first of all, we've had so many amazing civic institutions come through with um, things that I've never even imagined being ways to civically engage. And so I'm really excited to learn about the the ideas that haven't even come across our plate yet um, and the ways that people are able to use the tools that we may have not initially um, anticipated. I can't wait to see this really be the living embodiment of how civic engagement can turn out to be so many different things in a hundred different wonderful ways. So that's what makes me really hopeful um, about civic season, just seeing civic the definition of civic engagement um, grow and expand into all the wonderful things that it is. Yeah, well said. I mean, I hope at Made by Us, we have our eyes on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. It's in 2026. Uh, so just five years away. And I really see the civic season as something that can grow and evolve. And it's going to take all of us. That's the key. You know, this is not a fixed thing. This is a very, very much living thing that needs your fingerprints on it. Um, so I see we have a commenter who has corrected my use of democracy. Yes, it's a democratic republic. And I think of you know, Ben Franklin, who said, I think Ben Franklin, maybe I'm getting this wrong too, but a republic if you can keep it. And so it is up to us to sustain our democracy, our democratic republic, to sustain our own individual efforts that we put forward in our communities, in our neighborhoods, on the larger national scale. And the civic season is one way to say, in the summer, this is what we're doing. You know, in the summer, ahead of the election season, ahead of the drumbeat, you know, that's so busy the rest of the time of the year, as we're already thinking about how we got here and these important moments in our past, let's get together and let's really make it count. 
you know, sand drop by sand drop to, to build that pile and that foundation. And just to like finish it off, the best part about Civic Season is that it is actually just a launch pad for the rest of the year. Um, and hopefully it also means that we get to be more aware of the different civic opportunities that kind of lay in wait throughout the year, post election, during the school year, over the holidays. Um, it's really just supposed to be a reminder that this is something that we can do year round. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation um, and we are just appreciating you guys sharing your time and your enthusiasm uh, and expertise with us. Thank you to our viewers as well for joining us uh, and we hope that you guys will tune back in next week as well. All right, thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thanks so much. <laughs>